Marvin Harrison Jr. and Malik Neighbors have arrived. Quentin Johnson could be the most consequential waiver pickup of the entire year. JSN finally has his breakout game. All of that and more in the second edition of the Fantasy Playbook. Let's get into it. First, Malik Neighbors. He had 18 targets today. And 24 points. Now, this was against, uh, granted, a very bad Washington Commanders defense. And I know that. However, he did have 24 points. He obviously had that touchdown. And he was getting so many targets that if we see this on a consistent basis from Malik Neighbors, he is going to be a pretty good return on value from where you draft from your fantasy drafts. We are really excited about him. And we are really excited about his other rookie counterpart, Marvin Harrison Jr. Yeah, Marvin Harrison Jr. had only half the targets that Malik Neighbors had in week two, but he still managed to get 27 points in half PPR formats because he just went absolutely bananas, had two touchdowns, two incredible long play catches. It, it was unbelievable, super fun to watch him get those connections with Kyler Murray. I think you're looking at the entire Arizona Cardinals offense as a whole, and you're really excited to see what they're going to be able to showcase for the entire season. I think that was an offense that was going under the radar uh, heading into 2024. The Jets running backs were actually both productive today. Brees Hall had 21 points. Braylon Allen had 19 points. Now, Braylon Allen was on seven carries and, and two of them were touchdowns, so we do need to keep that in mind. Uh, Braylon Allen is going to be somebody that we're going to consider wavering. We'll talk about that in our waiver section. Uh, but Brees had 21 points and a touchdown and Allen with two touchdowns. It is going to be interesting to see how the backfield is split between these two guys moving forward. Calvin Ridley putting up 23 points against Sauce Garner in that just Jets defense was something that I personally did not see coming. I've been a big Ridley fan heading into this season, did not think he was going to have a good week in week two against the Jets, and he goes and he scores two touchdowns. or Yeah, one, one on the ground and one in the air as well. So, uh, look, with Calvin Ridley, he only had six targets, four receptions, turning two of those opportunities in that offense into touchdowns. That's not something that you're going to see every single week. Will Levis still looked absolutely horrible, so I would take this production and this show with a grain of salt. But Calvin Ridley looks like Calvin Ridley, even in a terrible situation. He's definitely a comfortable flex option week in and week out. Real quick, it says that 85% or more of you guys are not subscribed. If you enjoy this video Whoa. and you enjoy getting this level of content, please do us a huge favor and drop a like and subscribe. Turn those notifications on. We drop this during Sunday Night Football so you can get access to the best information before your league mates. We'd appreciate it if you subscribe for us. Let's talk about HN. Thursday night, Obviously, was scary with Tua, but Achan was still able to get his own. He had 26 points. Uh, he did have a touchdown, and he was in the game really like when it was still a blowout. And I don't know why he was still in the game, but he did prove that he can be productive without Tua Tagovailoa, and I think mm -hmm. that's important. If Achan can continue to stay healthy and stay on the field, he is absolutely going to be a league winner this year. He looks like a top three running back lock pretty much while he's on the field. James Cook also looks like an absolute lock to be a top six to eight running back. If he can keep this pace going in this opportunity, he really scored 28 points and a half. They didn't really even use him the second half because they didn't need to. That game was over before it even started. And James Cook was a big reason for that. I think more of a, a bigger reason why you're so excited about James Cook in this offense is this offense is built for him. And it's really not built for the receiving assets in that offense. I mean, you just saw Keon Coleman lay a goose egg. You saw Khalil Shakir being the lead receiver with only five targets and eight points. I think James Cook is the guy to own in that offense next to or on even over Dalton Kincaid, to, to me, this is the perfect situation for him in 2024. Let's talk about JSN. Finally, we see it with JSN. 18 points today, and you might say, yeah, that's not you know crazy. It's not, but he had 16 targets for 117 yards. Gosh. 16 targets. Finally, we saw Geno Smith really heavily rely on JSN. If you drafted JSN, this is a super encouraging sign. Uh, DK also had a big day with 24 points, but both of these guys are the wide receiver one, wide receiver two in their offense. Obviously, DK with the big play ability, and JSN with the high target volume JSN could look like a week-to-week -week starter if he continues this pace we're really excited to see him break out Quentin Johnston I remember last year we were talking about him just trying to validate our early round picks for him in fantasy every time that he got a catch we we're like he doesn't look that bad and then he just continued to suck today he actually looked good in an offense that's way way better than it ever was under Brandon Staley Justin Herbert able to get him the ball five times and he hauls in two touchdowns as well he had some impressive catches in the red zone was really really happy to see QJ finally come along um, he's going to be again we're going to touch on him more in the waiver section of this video, but a guy that you want to have your eyes on and probably your waiver dollars contributed towards this week. 
Jordan Mason actually was productive this week. He had 17 points. Uh, the San Francisco 49ers obviously losing, and I will say their offense looks drastically different without Christian McCaffrey. Mm-hmm. When you're looking at some of the other guys in that offense, Debo was able to produce. He had 14 points, but again, Brandon Ayuk, four receptions for 43 yards, only had six points again this week, and so it will take a little bit for him to get productive. I do like that George Kittle had eight targets, caught seven of them, and did have a touchdown. He had 17 points. With that being said, it is going to be interesting to monitor that 49ers offense because they're clearly a lot less dynamic without their star player in the lineup. All of the people that said J.J. wasn't going to be able to produce without Kirk Cousins or produce at a way lesser uh, rate are silent and are silent for a second straight week. J.J. puts up 21 points in an incomplete game where he leaves with an injury, something that we're going to want to monitor heading into week three. Maybe he misses a game, maybe not. I think he's going to be okay. But look, at the end of the day, getting that big 87-yard touchdown was awesome. It made his day. Um, This is just classic J.J. What, What else do you want from him? He's the best wide receiver in the NFL. Yeah. I can't imagine trading him away on my fantasy team. No. Let's talk about the Colts since we're absolutely miserable right now. Uh, AR, Can we? nine points. Not. I mean, he went to the complete opposite of the spectrum. He didn't have that big touchdown. He didn't have, yeah, it, it, it's bad. And I'm concerned for Pittman. Pittman had four points. Uh, Alec Pierce, again, was the most productive wide receiver there. It might be worth talking about a little bit, but he's just because he's a consistent deep threat. And that's about all they have right now is like chucking balls down the field. Now, at I will least say, he threw the ball 34 times. <laughs> that's, that's true. He got the volume, right? But yeah. I will say this. I am encouraged that Jonathan Taylor who in an offense where it was not good today was still able to produce, still had 15 points. Mm -hmm. Uh, He was still productive. And so I'm encouraged by that, even though Jonathan Taylor did not have a touchdown, I am concerned for Michael Pittman with only three and a half points. Yeah, I'm definitely not concerned about Chris Godwin anymore. I mean, he looks like the top option for Baker Mayfield, the guy that Baker Mayfield is consistently the most comfortable with because, again, he's the easiest target in that offense. Mike Evans, you can get the ball to him downfield, and he's going to have some really, really great games. But this is what we feared with Mike Evans heading into 2024 were some essentially goose egg weeks. And, and no, Mike Evans didn't put up a goose egg. He still had six targets, three, three receptions, 42 yards, put up 5.7 points in half PPR formats. But Chris Godwin is the safest highest floor, most consistent asset that you're going to have in Tampa Bay's offense this year. Could not be more excited for his continued outlook for the rest of the season. I think this guy, I mean, oof. I, I don't I don't want to jump the gun, but this guy has low on wide receiver one upside if he keeps this going. Let's talk about the Lions and specifically Sam Laporta because something has happened that's been a little bit interesting at the beginning of the season. You saw J-Mo get 11 targets today. You saw Jameer Gibbs get nine targets. That's normal. Amon Ross get 18 targets. Sam Laporta had two targets. Sam Laporta has eight points through the first two games of the season, and that's going to concern a lot of you. Obviously, we're going to cover Sam Laporta a lot on our buy, sell, hold video, but it's concerning so far. And I do think this offense is going to shift back more towards what's normal for them. And I think that's going to include Sam Laporta getting more targets than he's seen through the first couple games. However, you are definitely concerned if you drafted Sam Laporta because you spent a third or fourth round pick on him. And at this point, production level he's not returning on his price so I saw a fun stat during the Saints and Dallas game today and and that was the last time a team scored 40 or more points in the first three games of the season was the 2007 New England Patriots right the 16 and 0 New England Patriots it's hilarious that we're actually talking about Derek Carr uh, a Derek Carr led offense being in that conversation with the potential to set uh, a, a record that hasn't been you know accomplished in almost two decades. So uh, Alvin Kamara is a huge reason for this. He puts up 43 points. Again, another guy that's looking like an absolute league winner where he was going at price in the fourth, fifth round of your fantasy drafts. Um, He gets four touchdowns. He's Alvin Kamara. He gets better the older he gets. How is that even possible? I... I don't know. It's Alvin Kamara. That's all I can say. Rashid Shahid has another game where he gets four targets, four receptions, and gets a big play touchdown. 18 points, outproduces Chris Olave, who again only has 10 points this week. Very disappointing. But with Shahid, I don't think you can expect this week in and week out, even though it's happened for two straight weeks. It's just not, it's not sustainable. Let's talk about Dobbins because J.K. Dobbins is still splitting carries with Gus Edwards. They are they are splitting. In fact, I think Edwards had one more carry than Dobbins. But again, what you saw in this game was Dobbins get a breakaway run for a touchdown. And I'm not going to discount that because it is important to note that Dobbins has looked like the better running back since he's been on the field mm-hmm. and Dobbins have, has gotten the goal line carries. Let's be careful with Dobbins, but he had 20 points today and a touchdown. It was against maybe the worst team I've seen in the NFL in quite a long time. Uh, they are astronomically bad, the Carolina Panthers. 
However, today we'll focus on J.K. Dobbins and the good that came with it. Right now, he's looking like the running back one in that offense, and he's producing at a level to where you really can't sit him right now in fantasy until it proves you otherwise. Every time I see Zay Flowers catch the ball, it looks like someone's playing a video game and using Zay Flowers and all of his ridiculous jukes and stuff. It's kind of extra. It's kind of insane, but uh, he gets the production 18 points this game off 11 targets, 7 receptions, 91 yards, and a touchdown. He gets that touchdown. He gets that usage that we're looking for. The usage, the opportunity was there in week one. He just wasn't able to capitalize in the red zone. He does in this game, and I, I think this is exactly what we wanted to see from Zay Flowers. He's got to keep this going. This guy has a wide receiver two outlook for the rest of the season if he can continue to be Lamar Jackson's top option and capitalize on that red zone opportunity. Somebody that looks like a league winner is Brock Bowers. And when you're looking at the usage rate for Brock Bowers, he ran a lot less routes than guys like Jacoby Myers, uh, guys like Devontae Adams, because the Raiders really weren't in 12 personnel a lot. Brock Bowers still had 14 points. He didn't even have a touchdown, but he had nine receptions um, and 100 yards. He looked really, really good. And as a rookie, he looks to be a focal point of that offense. He looks to be a tight end in a landscape where you have Kelsey dropping duds, where you have Sam Laporta dropping duds. We have Evan Ingram pulling a hamstring during warmups. Brock Bowers is a bright spot. He is, in my opinion, a league winner in fantasy football this year. And I think at the price that you got him in your drafts, you are absolutely thrilled that he's on your fantasy team right now and he looks like he's going to get consistent target volume the entire year for the Raiders I am thrilled about Brock Bowers mm. and I actually think he could continue to improve as the season goes on yeah I totally agree Isaiah likely followed up a 21 point week one performance with a three target three point performance in week two in a game that was plenty productive for him to be productive as well and you would say oh well the reason he didn't do that had to have been because Mark Andrews had a crazy game he didn't Mark Andrews outproduced Isaiah likely, but not by much. He only had seven points and five targets. Look, at the end of the day, I think you are pretty worried about both Andrews and likely in their consistency and Andrews ceiling this season because I think we've seen year after year Lamar Jackson is only able to help a one receiving asset produce at a high level. And if that's Zay Flowers, Mark Andrews and likely are hurting like consistently, not to mention Derrick Henry in the run game, who had a pretty solid day as well. So this is something that we're going to have to continue to monitor. We're not going to panic sell Mark Andrews because you're not getting much from Mark Andrews at the moment, but gosh, even when he outproduces Isaiah likely, he doesn't do that much. And he didn't even get his first touch or his first target until close to the end of the first half. It is a little bit concerning. I will say that, but, uh, Kyler Murray looks unstoppable. He he is all the way back. He looks healed from his ACL. And in terms of fantasy production, he had 28 points today. Uh, he had three total touchdowns versus the Rams. The Cardinals demolished the Rams. Yeah. And I think this is a fantasy football offense that we may have been sleeping on. With Marv, with Trey McBride, with even Michael Wilson and Greg Dortch, I think Kyler has a lot of options he can spread the ball around. And he's just so good at extending plays. You are going to get that rushing upside with Kyler. And everybody knew that. But a lot of people really weren't jumping on that on that bandwagon because he was still going in the seventh, eighth round of your fantasy football drafts where you had guys with rushing upside like Hertz and Lamar going in the third or fourth round. In reality, Kyler probably should have been going up there with those guys. He looks that good and I think he's going to score at that level for the rest of the season. We've seen it now in two straight weeks from Kyler. I think he's going to be productive like crazy this season. Guys, Rasheed Rice is the truth. If you didn't think it before, I hope you think it now because we're now seeing two straight games where he has out-targeted every other asset in that offense, out-produced everyone, and it's not even close, including Travis Kelsey. I think Rasheed Rice and his yak ability, his ability to score touchdowns is just, uh, he is the best weapon in that offense. And Travis Kelsey is once again, a non-factor. So we're two, two straight weeks into the season. Travis Kelsey is starting really slow. Um, I don't think he's dead in the water. I don't think he's going to be like this all season, but I think you've seen Travis Kelsey's best days uh, behind him. And he's probably not going to have the upside or the ceiling that you have previously expected him to have for the last seven years. But. Mike Gusecki, who you probably remember from the Dolphins, now plays for the Bengals, was actually the leading receiver for the Cincinnati Bengals against the Chiefs in a really good game. But Gasecki and the tight ends were really productive there. Gasecki was the main guy. He had nine receptions um, and he had 12 points in fantasy football leagues. And I think that Mike Gasecki is going to be somebody that you are feeling good about picking up off of waivers with how he's used. He had a touchdown in week one, right? And so I think you can plug him in if you're having tight end issues. Uh, if you need tight end depth, then I think he's going to be a popular waiver pickup this week. And let's get now to the rookie report section uh, of our video today. I'll cover the rookie report. I'll let you cover injuries. Awesome. Let's just cover the top five most productive rookies. We talked about Marv, 27 points, four receptions, eight targets, 130 yards, and two touchdowns. Marv looks 
like one of the best X prospects to come out in 15 years. And he is one of those prospects. We just were impatient after week one. He lives up to the hype. And it is fitting that Malik Neighbors is right there behind him with 24 points, 18 targets versus eight. And so that's the difference between these two, right? Marv's on a better offense, but he's going to be bigger play. He's going to be touchdown guy. Malik Neighbors can be that, but he's also going to get a crazy amount of targets because of the offense he's on. Now, the offense is worse, but... Malik Neighbors projects really well for the rest of the season, in my opinion. Braylon Allen was the third highest scoring rookie today. Uh, 19 points. Again, seven attempts Gosh. for 33 yards uh, and a touchdown. He did have two receptions for 23 yards as well and obviously mm-hmm. had a touchdown there. But Braylon Allen, again, he's going to be a waiver pickup this week and we'll see how he fits into that offense with Brees Hall. Brees Hall, obviously one of the best running backs in the NFL. Brock Bowers, right here behind all these guys. 14 points. Again, nine targets, nine receptions, 98 yards. Beautiful stat line. They upset the Ravens. We're really excited about Brock Bowers. Uh, and then again, Jaden Daniels because a lot of the other rookie wide receivers today have been pretty quiet. Uh, 13 points for him. He didn't do a ton. He was 23 to 29 with 226. I didn't think he had a bad game by any means. Uh, in terms of rushing, he only had 44 yards, didn't have a touchdown, didn't really have uh, any touchdowns today. So, you know, you saw that ceiling be a little bit capped in a game where he probably should have scored more points against the Giants. Uh, but Tom, Brian Thomas had 10. Uh, Polk had a touchdown today. Burton had a really long pass today. Uh, Xavier Worthy back to the mean, right? McMillan didn't have a touchdown today. And so all of these guys are kind of reverting back to uh, what is going to be a rookie year for a lot of these guys. And that's going to be a lot of inconsistencies and a lot of ups and downs. So, uh, but overall still the, the, the studs, Marvin Harrison Jr. Malik Neighbors highlighted the rookies today. Yeah, uh, big time players uh, were, were dropping like flies this week. I, I feel like everyone at this point is feeling the pain of injuries. It was just the Puka owners last week, it felt like, and now it's everyone. Um, <laughs> it starts with Tua, has another really rough looking concussion Thursday night, no timetable. Um, I'd expect him to be out at least a week or two, right? And it, longer than most people um, who suffer from concussions, just given his history. He has said that he has no plans to retire, and a lot of people are expecting him to like, retire, which I wouldn't blame him if he did, but two is going to be back at some point. Just kind of got to wait and see on that one. Hope he gets better soon. Justin Jefferson ha- had to leave that game early with a quad contusion. He is day to day and expects to be fine for next week. Um, he may be a little slow next week. I-, I don't know. Maybe they limit him. Quad contusion. That sounds pretty rough, pretty uncomfortable. Um, but again, he's going to be fine. Not going to be anything long term. Amon Ra, uh, he injured his lower body, something with his knee or his leg. We don't really know. He was limping quite a bit, like midway through the game. And then at the end, it seemed like he re aggravated it again. He just got really really, really beat up. Dan Campbell says he doesn't believe it's long-term. Um, I wish they used better language than that because that doesn't make me feel any better about the injury. I think it was quads. So I don't I think believe it's, it's long-term. I think it's fine. <laughs> it, it should be okay. Amon Ross should be fine. The, the amount of targets he got in this game was awesome. Justin Herbert, uh, he definitely got rolled up in this game uh, w- with a sack. Uh, his x-rays were negative. We should know more in the next couple of days. He definitely was walking gingerly after that hit. Um, so that's something that we're going to want to monitor and follow it. That would suck, especially after a QJ breakout cup. Oh my gosh, dude. Cooper Cup was supposed to be a league winner after Puka goes down. Now we don't know what to do with the Rams offense. Cup leaves with an ankle injury. He's doubtful, uh, was doubtful to return. He did not return, and uh, he left in a walking boot. So who knows how many weeks he's going to be out at this point. We don't know, um, but that's it, it's going to get ugly in in LA real, real fast. Ty J Spears did not return with an ankle injury at this point. It's all Tony Pollard. It was before the injury. It definitely is now. Um, again, don't know the time of the timetable with Ty J at this point, you got to be looking at Tony Pollard as the top option there without a question. Tank Bigsby leaves with a shoulder injury. He did not return as well. Um, again, I think you kind of get back to basics with Travis Etienne getting all the um, important carries and opportunities in that offense. And then Pacheco is having tests done on his ankle after that four o'clock game against the Cincinnati Bengals. We'll, want to follow that closely as well. Carson steals the next man up. All right, let's go through our waivers now and we'll go kind of through priority here. Let's start uh, with the lowest priority. It's going to be Antonio Gibson. We have him on this list because he had 11 points today. He's rostered in 2% of leagues. We'd recommend dropping, you know, two to three is what we say. I'd even go, you know, as far as one to two, maybe don't even bet on him. Uh, It's just somebody that he looks like he could have some receiving upside on a week to week basis. So if you do have a need at running back, it could be somebody you need to stream. If you have a lot of injury issues or if you're in a really deep league or something like that, Gibby might be a good pickup. Yeah, and then we've got Jalen Naylor here who, again, he only had a touchdown and all that stuff because J.J. left that game. So if J.J. ends up missing a game or something like that, you can go snag Jalen Naylor. And if you're really, really rough with injuries, totally depleted with injuries on your fantasy roster, then maybe you have to flex him. But look, this is not a guy that I see sustained success long term, so I'm not dropping a ton of waiver dollars on him. But he also is technically the second option there in the receiving game since Addison is out indefinitely. 
Uh, let's talk about Yoshivas again, because this one's interesting. He was kind of a waiver guy last week. He's only rostered now in 15% of leagues, and he had two touchdowns today, right? But he only had a couple receptions, and two of them were touchdowns. I'm pretty sure he only had two receptions for two touchdowns. So uh, maybe drop you know, 5% of your waiver budget on him if you really think that he's going to have a role the rest of the season. Uh, I really don't think I'm going to be bidding on him much just because I think the depth at wide receiver across the league is good enough to where guys like Yoshivas, even when they have breakout games like this, we don't really need to roster them unless we have guys on our team that are just not performing at this point. Everyone knew that Alec Pierce's production in week one was not sustainable and that wasn't going to happen again, at least in that way. But then Pierce goes and puts up another 15 plus point game in week two with seven targets, doubles the, more than doubles the amount of targets that he had in week one. Um, he's a guy that seems to have really connected with Anthony Richardson as a passer. How much is that really saying production wise? I don't really know because they are so inaccurate, but I mean, Pierce has been the lead wide receiver there over Michael Pittman and everyone else in that offense uh, for the first two weeks of the year. And that's definitely something that you want to look at. I think dropping 5% of your fob is totally reasonable for Alec Pierce, especially if he's going to continue to get like six, seven, eight targets in a game. Mike Gusecki is going to be another guy here. We talked about him earlier, but I think he's going to be pretty high on our list because of the fact that there are a lot of tight ends right now that you just are not feeling comfortable starting. And Gusecki is in a good offense, but he is a particularly favorite target of Joe Burrow so far early this season. And that's a good thing. And you see Joe Burrow targeting somebody like this, especially somebody that's on the waiver wire. He's rostered in 9% of leagues. Uh, we're going for it. So free agent bidding, you know, about 5%. If you need a tight end, I would go. If you don't need a tight end, I probably wouldn't pick him up because he's not going to have a ton of trade value. Yeah, and then we're going to have Braylon Allen here as our second priority. I, again, not dropping a ton on him, probably 5-ish percent on him because he is... Brees Hall's backup, what really is his upside, his ceiling there. I don't think you're going to see him get multiple touch, touchdowns with Brees Hall getting another touchdown, being able to do that. Like to me, that's probably more of a fluky performance. But when you're looking at how many running backs in the league are going down, dropping like flies again, I, I mean, not just running backs, but wide receivers all over the place, like Braylon Allen at least is a nice insurance guy to have if you're a Brees Hall owner, just to feel a little secure if you do have a roster spot. And then the number one waiver pickup for us this week is going to be Quentin Johnson. This is the only guy really we're going to have above 5% of our budget we're spending on because QJ is, he does have the opportunity. He does have the pedigree. He does have the quarterback. And so the situation for Quentin Johnson couldn't be much better. Is this the game that actually turns his career around? And obviously the difference between this game and other games wasn't really his usage. He was playing about the same as he was at the end of last year and even into this year. The difference was he actually caught the balls that were thrown to him. And if Quentin Johnson can do this consistently, he is somebody that could be flexible on a week-to-week -week basis. And so... With that being said, he's rostered in 17% of leagues. And I'm going to say to get him, you're going to have to drop 20 to 40% of your waiver budget. I think that's what it's going to take. And so I would look in that range. I think if you're spending above that, you're going a little bit overboard. Um, but I'm going to be particularly aggressive with Quentin Johnson in some of my leagues just because I do think he could be one of the better waiver pickups. And really, as you see across the board here, the waivers are pretty weak this, this week. <laughs> weak this week. Sorry. Nice. The waivers are pretty weak this week. And so with that in mind... I think that Quentin Johnson is one of the few guys we've seen so far on waivers that actually has serious upside this season. So, yeah. And then moving over to buys, we're going to talk about Brian Robinson here. He had a pretty solid day, 14 points and a half PPR. He had 133 rushing yards. Again, totally out carrying Austin Eckler, who only had eight to be Rob 17. He even got like one reception for three yards. Again, all that receiving usage is going to go mostly to Austin Eckler. But when you're looking at B Rob, he's a very safe option. If you're wanting safety and security at the running back position and you don't want to be absolutely screwed, like they're definitely utilizing B Rob to a, a, a sustainable extent where you could see B Rob doing this all year as long as he stays healthy. And I think it's just kind of being overlooked because of the rushing upside of Jaden Daniels, because of everything going on in Washington and how disgusting it is overall. Their defense is awful. Their offense doesn't look that great, even with Daniels and how talented he is. B-Rob's kind of just the afterthought, but when you're looking at the production and what he's able to do, he's just... He's so consistent, and he did this last year, too. One guy we are probably going to send some offers for is Christian Kirk, and it's not because Christian Kirk, we're super excited and we're not worried at all. We are a little bit concerned. Uh, this is a guy that's had four total points this season. It was a tough matchup today against the Cleveland Browns. And so I think you're going to get him really cheap. I think if you're struggling with wide receiver depth at all, you can go send some offers for Christian Kirk and get him for some guys that are probably cuttable or waiver waiver level guys. Maybe you have somebody that's like, yeah, I'm not going to panic. I'm going to hold. I still believe in him because we've seen what Christian Kirk can do right over the last two years. Christian Kirk has been a productive fantasy wide receiver with this quarterback in the system. And so I think that alone is worth sending some feelers out for Christian Kirk, because again, I think after the first two games of the season, you're going to have people selling him really cheap in some leagues. George Kittle is always a guy that, look, his upside's amazing. He's always going to finish as a top six tight end as long as he's healthy. But he is, on a week-to-week -week perspective, pretty inconsistent. But now with Christian McCaffrey being out for the foreseeable future, like six weeks or more, I think you're looking at George Kittle really being a 
super solid option every single week who is probably going to be more consistent than you're you're used to with George Kittle normally because of all the stuff that they're dealing with without Christian McCaffrey in that offense now, because McCaffrey really just takes away so much red zone opportunity with those touchdowns. And now that's all going to be going to your best playmakers and Kittle and Debo. Honestly, Ayuk is going to be more of the, you don't really know as much. He's kind of utilized all over the field. Kittle and Debo are the guys you want to get the ball to in the red zone because they're just so good after the catch. But um, I, I, for one, am really excited to see what Kittle's able to do while CMC is out. He had a great game today left on the cart because of cramping came back. He was totally fine. So don't worry about that. And let's finish this up with three quick sells here. Number one is going to be JK Dobbins for me. And a lot of people are going to be mad. JK Dobbins is a fan favorite. A lot of you picked him up late in drafts and and, and people just tend to get upset when we talk about JK Dobbins in any sort of negative light. And I understand it. And basically what this is, because he's averaging 20 points a game right now. Basically what this is, is me betting a, when the competition gets more tough because he's played Carolina and Vegas so far, when the competition gets tough, when the competition gets tougher, I think that JK Dobbins is probably going to take a little bit of a step back. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is we've not seen JK Dobbins play a whole season. We've not seen it. He, he, he has consistently gotten hurt every year. He's been in the NFL. I I don't want to sit here and predict injury. And and obviously the exception being his rookie where he played most of the year. And I don't want to sit here and predict injury, but that is a reason that I'm selling him. It is. I, I think he. I do think at some point he's going to end up on the injury report this year. And so I think you capitalize on what is probably going to be some really good value for J.K. Dobbins. I think you can go get a lot safer guy with a lot higher upside and a lot more security on your fantasy team than J.K. Dobbins. I do like J.K. Dobbins, but again, I, I do think at some point we're going to see him probably A, regress back to the mean, or B, take an injury. So. This is the first time that we have seen Rashid Jaheed put up two back-to-back productive weeks. Everybody give him a hand. Everybody give him a hand. Could not be more excited for the guy. Uh, He still was utilized the exact same way in an offense that looks super explosive and they're on fire right now. Look, I am all for Rashid Shahid having great games like this. I, I love watching him as a player. He's so explosive, so fun when he gets the ball in his hands, but this is just not sustainable. It it is not. And if you have anyone in your league that's super excited about Rashid Shahid and what he offers for the Saints and for their fantasy team production-wise on a week-to-week basis, I'd be capitalizing on that and and selling Rashid Shahid high. And then the last guy here is going to be Devin Singletary. And Devin Singletary did have a 14-point game today, and I think that's why you can actually get some value for him now. The The concerning thing with Devin Singletary for me is he scored his touchdown from like seven yards out, when they were inside the five, they were giving all the carries to Tyrone Tracy. So, and Tyrone mm-hmm. Tracy's a bigger back. I think this is kind of not a surprise, but I do think that if Devin Singletary is going to be in this bad of an offense and not get the goal line carries, I'm not really interested in rostering him rest of the season because I'm not going to feel comfortable starting him. So I think after this game where he was fairly productive, you see what you can get for Devin Singletary. So there you go. That's the playbook for this week. Make sure, like I said, drop a like and make sure you are subscribed. If you play fantasy football, if you enjoy this level of content and production, we really put a lot into making sure that you guys have the best possible fantasy advice so we appreciate it if you did those two things because they really really help us out but stay tuned video coming tomorrow buy lows you're not going to want to miss it we appreciate you guys we'll see you later <laughs>